Welcome, everyone. I'm Dr. Sally Blair, Senior Director of Fellowship Programs here at the National Endowment for Democracy. On behalf of NED's International Forum for Democratic Studies, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's presentation, The Roots of Illiberalism in Hungary and Central Europe, featuring Reagan Fassell Democracy Fellow Gabor Schering. We are delighted to have with us as a discussant Christopher Walker, Vice President for Studies and Analysis here at the Endowment. Funded by the U.S. Congress, the Reagan Fassell Democracy Fellows Program hosts some of the world's most dedicated democratic activists, scholars, and journalists to conduct independent research and pursue projects here at NED. Now in our 17th year, the program has hosted more than 260 fellows from over 90 countries since its founding in 2001. Within this remarkable group, our speaker today stands out for his unwavering commitment to both the theory and practice of democracy in Hungary. After the fall of the Berlin Wall, Hungary and Poland were heralded as among the most successful cases of liberal reform of the former socialist countries in Central and Eastern Europe. Yet, only two and a half decades later, authoritarian politics have reemerged in the public life of both countries. How can this puzzle of post-socialist illiberalism in Central Europe be explained? Some observers claim that countries in the region have never been truly democratic, and their recent turn merely fits a historical pattern. Others argue that the success of a liberal politics is rooted in the clever political maneuvering of authoritarian politicians. In this presentation, Gabor Schering will offer a third explanation. Based on new data and case studies, he will argue that it is impossible to understand illiberalism's role in Central Europe without analyzing the rightward shift of the working middle class and the political mobilization of the national business elite. His comments will shed light on the socio-economic roots of the authoritarian turn in Hungary while also offering comparative insights into recent developments in Poland and the Czech Republic. Dr. Gabor Schering is a political economist and democratic activist currently working as a research associate in the Department of Sociology at the University of Cambridge. He is also chairman of the Progressive Hungary Foundation, a think tank dedicated to progressive policy research and civic education. An active opposition figure in his country, Dr. Schering served as a member of the Hungarian Parliament from 2010 to 2014. As an expert on the impact of economic change on health, identity, and democracy, he has authored several journal articles and four volumes on economic development and democracy. Christopher Walker is Vice President for Studies and Analysis at the National Endowment for Democracy. In this capacity, he oversees the department that is responsible for NED's multifaceted analytical work which includes the International Forum for Democratic Studies, a leading center for the analysis and discussion of democratic development. Chris has 20 years of experience supporting democracy and independent media around the world. Prior to joining NED, he was Vice President for Strategy and Analysis at Freedom House. He is the author with Jessica Ludwig of From Soft Power to Sharp Power, Rising Authoritarian Influence in the Democratic World, and co-editor with Larry Diamond and Mark Plattner of Authoritarianism Goes Global, The Challenge to Democracy, published in 2016. We will now turn the floor over to Gabor, who will speak for approximately 30 minutes, or so he promises me, followed by Chris for about 10 minutes. For those of you on Twitter, you can follow this presentation and contribute to the conversation by using the hashtag NetEvents or by following the forum at ThinkDemocracy and the endowment at NEDemocracy. If you have not already done so, please take a moment to silence your cell phones. And let me take this opportunity to thank the many staff members involved with this event and most especially research associate Jenny Barker, who has offered vital assistance 
to the fellowship project and today's presentation. Thank you. Gabor. Thank you very much, Sally, for the uh, kind introduction. And uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity to NED, to the people at NED, to, to be here and uh, reflect on my experience with Hungarian politics and democracy and conduct research. And of course, thank you uh, for being here. I think uh, the very fact that so many of you uh, are here to to listen to what I have to say about the roots of illiberalism shows the very uh, severity of the problem that we are uh, facing in Hungary and in Central Europe. Um, as Sally has said, this is a presentation based on, on an ongoing uh, research uh, that I'm doing um, on, on the political economy of, of illiberalism in, in, uh, in Hungary and in Central Europe. So this will be uh, some preliminary results that I'm going to uh, present you. So here's uh, what I uh, uh, plan to do in the next uh, 30 minutes or so. So uh, we'll try to elaborate the puzzle. We'll uh, try to uh, convince you that the existing theories do not give a sufficient explanation of what's happening in Hungary and in Central Europe. And I uh, will elaborate very briefly a new, a new political economic approach, which is uh, focusing on two key processes, the right wing shift of working class and the revolt of the national business class. I will then uh, briefly elaborate the comparative framework with some comments on happenings in Poland and, and the Czech Republic, and I will offer some theoretical and, and policy uh, conclusions and recommendations. So let's uh, start with, uh, with a puzzle. As, uh, as most of you know, uh, the region, Eastern European region, post-socialist uh, Eastern Europe, uh, was uh, seen by many analysts uh, uh, as a proof of, of, uh, of, of Fukuyama's thesis that a combination of liberal democracy and liberal capitalism is sort of the best political economic model that there is on, on, on offer. And for many, many years, it really looked like that these countries are really on their way to prove this thesis uh, right. And especially Poland, the Czech Republic, and Hungary were seen as front runners of, uh, of democratization and, and institutional reforms. Uh, every the majority of these post-socialist countries joined the European Union, Poland, Czech Republic, and Hungary, so on. Most reports uh, uh, um, have highlighted the, 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 the depth of, of reforms, and especially Hungary was very often portrayed as, as a front, front runner of these uh, uh, institutional uh, restructuring. However, as it turns out, history has, uh, has not yet ended. And uh, as uh, you can see, based on the, on the democracy scores, uh, uh, the de democracy evaluation by Freedom House, the quality of democracy in Hungary has been deteriorating since 2006 already, but especially after 2010, that is when Viktor Orban was elected for the second time with a two-thirds majority and started to build what he uh, has called a liberal democracy or the liberal state. So there is a serious uh, backsliding in democratic quality. And as you can see, by 2017, Hungary is uh, the lowest in terms of democratic quality. So there is really something, uh, I would say, creepy happening in, in, uh, in Hungary. And the question is how we can explain. How can we make sense of, of this rise of, of illiberal politicians? And my hope is that by uh, by offering a new understanding of this, in the future we might have uh, happier uh, Valentine's Days than, 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 than today we have. So um, what are the existing th theories on offer? Well, um, uh, institutionalist explanations uh, focus on checks and balances, liberal constitutions, the European Union as a lock-in mechanism. But um, as we all know, Hungary has uh, been a member of the EU and has had a strong uh, liberal institutions before 2010, so institutions in themselves were clearly not enough uh, to stop democratic backsliding. Another explanation focuses on the role of political elites, uh, the supply of illiberal ideas, political polarization, corruption, the mafia state, uh, basically arguing that it is bad politics that leads to bad institutions. Fukuyama himself has, uh, 
has, has argued so about Hungary in two blog posts in 2012. But Hungary has received the highest scores for good governance before 2010. So the question is, why was good politics successful and bad politics unsuccessful before 2010? What explains this, uh, this dramatic shift? A third explanation focuses on political culture. Uh, many people and many analysts point out that, is, uh, that there are historical legacies, uh, historical legacies of illiberal political culture that de determine uh, political uh, outcomes. And many people have started to argue that Eastern Europeans and Hungarians have never been truly or deeply liberal enough. And this is a particularly popular explanation in, 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 in Hungary. But I think that this is simply not true. There was a very high support for democracy in Hungary uh, uh, in the 90s and also a low level of xenophobia during the early 90s. And I will show you that even before Orbán took power in 2009, there was a quite high support for liberal values in Hungary. And the fourth explanation focuses on foreign influence, uh, Russia, China. And I definitely agree that these countries are emerging as, as, as important uh, partners uh, of, of Hungary and Poland as well. But I, I, I think that their role was less important in installing uh, the liberal uh, regime. Uh, as opposed to being a partner once it has been established. So uh, there's a need uh, for a new explanation. And uh, here's what I'm proposing. Uh, uh, from, from this uh, political economic uh, perspective, the central research question is how the particular variety of post-socialist capitalism institutionalized in Hungary impacted the prospects uh, for democratic consolidation. And the central thesis is that the exhaustion of, uh, of this very particular variety of post-socialist capitalism has led to the rightward shift of the working class, which was a necessary but not a sufficient condition of illiberalism in Hungary. The support of the national business class is a crucial uh, factor for the su success of the illiberal state. And let me try to convince you about the validity of this uh, thesis with a few uh, facts in the uh, next 20 minutes or so. So let's start with the right or shift of the working class. As uh, many of you probably know, um, well, Hungary has had a, well, not the best, but a relatively good record with economic growth during the 90s and 2000s. There was a collapse uh, in, in production in the early 90s, but economic growth recovered. But if you look beyond economic growth, what you can see is a serious collapse in employment during the uh, 90s. And the level of employment has remained particularly low in Hungary throughout uh, the, the 20 years before Orban took power. And as you can see, it is uh, the lowest among Eastern European countries, but actually it was one of the lowest in the whole OECD region. Uh, another problem uh, next to the uh, low uh, employment was uh, a low level of wages. And, um, well, a typical Hungarian worker would compare him or herself uh, to an Austrian worker. And uh, when you do this, you can see that uh, uh, the value so expressed in purchasing power parity of, of uh, an average uh, salary of an average Hungarian uh, was uh, uh, lagging behind every other Eastern European country. And uh, the absolute difference uh, to Austria has actually even grown uh, from 2000 to 2010. So this speed of uh, catching up of, or, or convergence was actually very, very, very slow. And this has resulted in some uh, serious frustration among Hungarian people and, and the working middle class. Well, uh, politics has definitely, of course, responded to these uh, social tensions. And the first and most important uh, response was to try to pacify the early victims of, of, of the transition in Hungary. Uh, through uh, various forms of early retirement. As you can see on this graph, the employment has collapsed uh, in Hungary during the uh, first half of the 90s. More than uh, one million jobs disappeared, and, uh, and basically no new jobs were created uh, during uh, the 90s and the 2000s. Uh, but unemployment went down after 93. So what happened to these people who lost their jobs? They completely uh, we have withdrawn from the labor market for good. And the main channel uh, for this was early uh, retirement in, in Hungary. This has, of course, 
uh, result in a strain on the, on the budget. Uh, but not everyone could retire. Uh, and um, working age flat families uh, extended their uh, relatively low wages through cons consumption finance uh, by uh, foreign currency loans. Uh, so this has resulted in, in an increasing debt of, of Hungarian households. As you can see, the, the steepest increase happened in Hungary during uh, the, the, the 2000s. And it's, uh, particular, it was particularly worrying that there was a very high share of foreign currency loans, uh, uh, as you can see above uh, 70 percent. And uh, during the financial crisis, this proved to be particularly risky and contributed to the severe financial fragility of many uh, Hungarian uh, uh, households. But there was a third wave of victims. Um, it, it's the young people. So uh, if you see, if you look at this graph, you can see that youth unemployment in Hungary has started to climb up from 2000 on, and it was the highest in 2009. Again, Hungary being a very bad performer. So you, young people who are not able to retire, obviously, but most of them were was not also not able to extend their consumption through uh, 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 loans. So they were facing um, uh, employment, uh, employment precariat, pre precariety and precariousness and, and, um, and a particularly bad situation. So what this has led to is a very high level of uh, financial precariousness among Hungarian uh, families. And as you can see, uh, during the 2000s, again, Hungary is the worst performer against uh, this group of Central and East European countries, with more than 70% of Hungarian families responding that they were unable to face unexpected expenses before Viktor Orban took power. So you have this serious financial fragility among Hungarian families. Some of them could be pacified through various policy measures, which ensure a level of support for this particular type of capitalism in Hungary. But by the end of 2000s, you have second and third wave victims uh, who are growing increasingly angry. And the result is that a large percent of Hungarians just lose their faith in capitalism. As you can see, 80% of Hungarians supported capitalism uh, in 91, but only 40% did so uh, by 2009. This is a research by, uh, by the Pew uh, Research uh, Center. And this is, again, the highest decrease, the biggest fall in the support for, for post-socialist capitalism in Hungary. Did this mean that Hungarians have, in general, become illiberal? I would say no. I, I would argue that there's no general cultural demand for illiberalism. And it's the same Pew research shows that, in general, for various uh, uh, liberal freedoms, there was a relatively high support. Uh, on average, almost 70% uh, of people supported various uh, liberal values. And, and this level was the highest in Hungary before 2000, uh, in 2009, so before Viktor Orban took power. So there was no cultural demand for particular authoritarian solutions, but people were disappointed with post-socialist capitalism. And of course, the political price had to be paid. And the socialists were in government between 2002 and, two, 2002 and 2010, and they were the ones who had to pay. They were the, the most associated with this uh, post-socialist uh, political economic regime. And what this chart shows is that working class people, so average workers, uh, this is a Weberian occupational definition of class, have stopped supporting the socialists. If the IF40 index is positive, it means that a particular party has higher support among workers. If it's negative, it means that less workers are supporting than the general population. And by 2006, workers have stopped supporting the Hungarian socialists and went on to support the center right, Fidesz, but also the radical right. Uh, so their economic anger has driven them to support uh, right-wing parties in, uh, in Hungary. To understand this process, I, I did uh, 82 interviews around deindustrializing towns in Hungary. And just would like to give you two quotes that sort of uh, illustrate this process of, uh, of disillusionment and right word shift. So there's this uh, former miner who is now working as a security guard in ICA who said that when you have democracy, you have to make sacrifices, and we made sacrifices. The problem is that we still keep on making only sacrifices. That's not what we expected. You know, the little people, the Joe six pack. We are sliding downwards. And I think that this is not fair. 
and it won't get any better. So I think you can clearly sense the, the growing frustration and anger that people have. And I think it's crucial to understand how this anger and, and the need for kind of social protection and solidarity gets re-articulated, expressed in nationalistic terms. This is a former bank clerk in, in Serenge, and she said that the nation is a special group of people with a shared goal and a shared understanding in their souls, with love imprinted at its core. And loving means caring for the other. The nation is strong. The nation is a nation if its members make it strong, and one doesn't make the other weak. The nation is like a giant chain. Every link in the chain has to be strong, and then even the weakest link is strong. So I think you can, again, clearly sense how the need for solidarity drives people to, to, to na nationalism, and this opens up the political space for neo-nationalist mobilization, especially if there's a lack for other kinds of progressive solidarities, progressive languages of solidarity, as it was in, in Hungary with the collapse of Socialist Party. But, as I will argue, this was not enough. This was only just a sufficient condition for illiberalism in Hungary. What you also need is the revolt of the national business class. And to understand it, we have to look at the structural difficulties of the Hungarian economy. Um, so I'm sure uh, many of you know that uh, the model uh, that post-socialist countries in Central Europe has chosen to develop their economies was uh, based on foreign investment, multinational uh, companies. And to attract foreign investors, these states have fiercely competed with each other um, through low corporate taxation, low corporate tax rates. And as you can see on this graph, based on OECD data, uh, this downward uh, tax spiral was pretty much driven by the low uh, taxation of, uh, of corporations in, in Hungary. Um, this especially uh, favors multinational companies because they are the ones who, who, who pay the, the, the who, uh, who, for, for whom corporate taxation is most important. It's less important for domestic small and medium-sized enterprises. And these domestic enterprises, at the same time, uh, were facing uh, serious financial difficulties in Hungary. So you, in general, you have a policy regime that favors transnational investors, and you have domestic entrepreneurs who sort of perceive that there's this glass ceiling and they cannot grow, and they're growing frustrated because of this. And one result is that uh, there's a high productivity difference between national enterprises and foreign-owned enterprises. So we have a very highly developed uh, foreign economic sector in the Hungarian economy, uh, knowledge-driven, innovation-driven, you know, all these assembled in Hungary. Uh, and then you have a domestic sector, uh, labor-intensive, less innovation, less knowledge, uh, low value-added production. This also means that these two different sectors uh, employ a different production regime, and they are interested in different policies and different uh, state behavior. And my argument is that it's the production regime of domestic enterprises that is labor intensive that has driven uh, many policies of the liberal state. So to understand this political polarization of different segments of the business elite in Hungary, I created a new data set. And this new data set measures the e economic and educational and occupational background of decision makers with an economic policy uh, profile. I can get into the details how I define this, uh, but it measures every decision maker from, to, uh, from 90 to 2010, so, uh, 2014 uh, with an economic policy profile. As you can see, uh, people who had an experience in the multinational sector, they were highly overrepresented in left-wing governments. On average, 35% of economic decision makers in left-wing governments uh, had a background in the multinational sector as opposed to the 15% of the right-wing governments. And as you can see, uh, the liberal state, the post-2010 Orban government, uh, this rate is particularly low, only uh, uh, 11%. At the same time, there's a growing political mobilization and, and deepening political uh, relationship between domestic companies and right-wing governments. And as you can see, uh, the share of people who had experience in the domestic business sector was growing throughout 
the years uh, between uh, in in uh, in the right wing governments and is the highest after 2010 with the with the with the second Orbán uh, government that in instituted the the liberal state. So you have this diverging political embeddedness of different segments of of of, of the business elite uh, who are and uh, the, the domestic business class has. Uh, growing is is growing has a growing anger and frustration with liberal capitalism as well in Hungary, and they tr they they start to lobby to restructure liberal capitalism. And let me just give you one example how they are doing this in 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 Hungary. So this is the tobacco sector, and then this is us uh, uh, demonstrating in a Hungarian uh, parliament against uh, the tobacco reform in 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 Hungary. Uh, what happened was that, um, well, to understand um, the story, there were four big uh, tobacco companies in Hungary that were privatized in 1990. Multinational companies uh, bought uh, most of them. And there was one small Hungarian domestic uh, company that managed to gain uh, a foothold in the tobacco sector. But again, you have the glass ceiling, the, the sector dominated by multinational companies, and they start to lobby. Uh, for a com complete restructuring of the sector. And this happens in 2012, so that's already the illiberal state. There's a new law, the tobacco trade is nationalized and there are new concessions given out. And as uh, the bill, the draft bill was sent out to consultation to the European Commission, oppositional MPs took a look uh, who actually authored the document. And it turns out that it was not any government official, but it was Jano Shanta, who was the manager and owner of Continental Tobacco. So he was the one driving the, the institutional restructuring of the tobacco sector. And the result was 1,000 new retail outlets run uh, uh, after the new concessions were given out by someone closely connected to Continental and to another uh, retail chain that is um, uh, domestically owned and again with very good political connections. So you can see these uh, domestic investors driving the restructuring of property rights in, in, in Hungary uh, uh, to accelerate their capital accumulation. To summarize uh, the results, uh, I created another data set which measures the wealth of left and right leaning billionaires. This is based on publicly available uh, data on the top 100 uh, economic entrepreneurs in, in Hungary, and I researched their political connections through publicly available data. So you have to interpret this with caution, but I think the general tendency is, 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 um, is, 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 is good, and, and you can grasp the process here. So the, the total number and wealth of left-leaning billionaires is, well, the total number is decreasing uh, sharply from 2002 to 2016, whereas the number of right-leaning billionaires is growing rapidly, uh, and so does their wealth also. The wealth of left-leaning billionaires is also increasing slightly, but much, much less so. So you have this accelerated capital accumulation of, of, uh, of right-wing or uh, oligarchs in, 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 in Hungary facilitated by the liberal state. Now, I've been uh, talking about this national business class for quite some time, and I think it's uh, worth to look at them in more detail, because they, I think they are a crucial actor here. And I'm not claiming that they are unified, they, they, that this is a unified uh, actor. There are politically created oligarchs, and these are the stories that you would read in newspapers about different relatives of Viktor Orban winning different concessions, and they are an important player. But as I have argued, there's another set of players who have not been politically created, who grew uh, frustrated by liberal capitalism in Hungary. These are politically influential national investors who drive the restructuring uh, of the tobacco sector, but many other sectors in Hungary. And there are passive supporters of the new regime, and there are the dissenting businessmen, who sort of are very few. <laughs> so to summarize, this is what has happened, I would argue, in Hungary. The tensions of post-socialist uh, uh, liberal capitalism in Hungary has led to the rightward shift of the working class, uh, but also to the revolt of the national business class. They lobbied to restructure existing social rights, property rights, which, of course, created uh, a lot of losers, a lot of victims. And to prevent the backlash, a descent from these uh, losers, 
uh, of accelerated capital accumulation, um, there, there was a need for a political solution, and this political solution was the liberal state. So the liberal state has emerged as a new political economic model to solve the tensions of, of uh, post-socialist capitalism in Hungary. What does this mean for other countries in the region? So again, this is an ongoing research project. This is what I'm going to deal with in the next year in Cambridge. Um, so these are just some preliminary comments. Um, so in Poland, I would argue that despite good economic growth, there was a less successful social strategy. So the fruits of growth were not really translated evenly to every, uh, every Polish uh, citizen throughout the last uh, decade. And there was also low wage growth in, uh, in Poland, and also very high levels of inequality, and particularly high level of youth unemployment, uh, especially before 2015, when uh, the Kaczynski party took, uh, took power and started the liberal engineering in Poland as well. And also high level of regional inequalities, ensure that there is a significant chunk of victims in, 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 in especially rural uh, towns in Poland. But their industrial strategy was more successful than the Hungarian one. There's a stronger national business class and less economic dualism. And the national business class is less pitted against uh, liberal capitalism as in the case of Hungary. The result is a moderately strong uh, illiberalism in Poland. In the Czech Republic, you have also uh, much better economic growth than in Hungary. But this is also translated into social progress higher level of employment, uh, much less unemployment, both through the early 90s and, and recently, lower levels of inequality, and also lower levels of precariousness. But they also have sort of more successful industrial strategy, again, uh, less economic dualism compared to Hungary, and a stronger domestic sector, and again, the national business class is less pitted against liberal capitalism, and there's no unified sort of block to restructure the institutions of liberal capitalism as it happened in Hungary. And I think the crucial question is how far uh, the different political actors will manage to, to unify these uh, descending voices, both in Poland and, and, and in the Czech Republic. So far, I would argue there was uh, no such unified coalition in the Czech Republic as in Hungary, so the result is is weak, uh, weak liberalism in, in, or no liberalism in the Czech Republic. So this is a sort of a summary of the international comparative framework. In Hungary, you have a vulnerable working class and a polarized economic elite, which lead to strong illiberalism as a, as a political uh, outcome. In, in Poland, uh, you can observe higher levels of precariousness, especially among rural uh, poor, uh, but the economic elite is less polarized and both left and right wing parties or both liberal and, and, and left wing parties or right wing parties in, in, in Poland try to represent interests of national business elite. So this results in moderate illiberalism. And in the Czech Republic, uh, you don't have any of these processes uh, or less so than in Hungary. So the result is is again, uh, again uh, a big illiberalism. So this is what I'm going to uh, elaborate and do more research on in the coming, uh, coming year or years. So to conclude, some theoretical lessons and, uh, and policy recommendations. Well, I think uh, one of the most important theoretical lessons is that uh, the, the, those policies uh, that were introduced in many of these countries and the particular type of uh, post-socialist capitalism that was institutionalized led to in insecurity and anxiety among working middle classes, and these proved uh, as a fertile uh, ground for neo-nationalist uh, mobilization. This is crucial to understand. So the lesson is that economic growth does not necessarily lead to better quality of life. You can have economic growth, but you can also have a frustrated citizenry at the same time if the fruits are not distributed evenly. But there's no guarantee that the national business class would support democracy either. And in fact, in Hungary, they grew frustrated with liberal capitalism, so they support the liberal state. So there's no theoretical reason to believe that this embourgeoisement would lead and facilitate uh, democratization, as many political theorists argue during the 90s and, and 2000s. Some political lessons. 
Well, lesson number one is I think that uh, there's a need to integrate uh, the working class uh, along inclusive lines. Because if there's no such uh, inclusion, then there's the, there's the political opportunity for nationalist mobilization. But this nationalist mobilization only works if there's no progressive mobilization. I think we also need to avoid the polarization of the economic elite. We shouldn't think that foreign investment solves all problems. I think they are crucial uh, actors in modernizing Hungary and many other countries, so there's definitely a need for foreign investment. But there, there's a need also for industrial policies that create more economic evenness. And we mustn't let the national business class get too nationalist as a result of economic dualism. And I think there's a need to rethink the role of the state in economic development. I think also we need to realize that without uh, social foundations, democratization is not sustainable. So democracy as a goal and, and economic uh, progress uh, are related to each other. So that's why I think we need democratic developmental state investment into human capital and industrial policies. What could be the recommendations for the international community? Well, I think there's the obvious uh, need for uh, capacity building uh, among, for, for social, domestic social movements. Independent media, that's crucial. I haven't talked about the media, but um, the rise of um, government-friendly oligarchs in the media sector is a serious issue but also for consumer protection and social inclusion, trade unions, and for participation, not just transparency, for example, as in the case of uh, participatory budgeting. So it's very important to support human rights uh, and NGOs that do work in human rights, but we also need to focus on, on social and economic rights, so to speak. There's also a need for capacity building for domestic small and medium-sized enterprises, I think, like learning, technology transfer, and more partnership with TNCs. So lobbyist associations and uh, uh, industrial groups representing with TNCs could sort of engage more directly with domestic uh, companies to facilitate learning. There's also a need for capacity building for political parties in the, in the region and in Hungary. I would argue that there was much less reflection and learning uh, among Hungarian uh, liberal elites in the US or in the UK. So I think there's a need to, to reflect and learn as well. And finally, some long-term lessons and, and long-term uh, policy goals for us here is to develop international institutions that foster democratic uh, and foster domestic economic development. Uh, how about an international transaction tax, for example, to re reduce financial uh, volatility and, and fund uh, development projects uh, throughout the world? This, this would be something to achieve on the long term. But I would say this would not only contribute to more economic stability globally, but also uh, would preempt nationalist mobilization and ensure the sustainability, especially of new uh, democracies around the globe. So um, thank you very much for your uh, attention. And there's a draft paper uh, available. And I'm happy to answer uh, your comments. But if there's no time to answer them here, I'm happy to answer them in, in writing later. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gabor, for that carefully researched, balanced, and well-articulated explanation. It is a tour de force. Um, I now want to ask Chris Walker to offer some comments and ask the first questions, and then we will have time for audience participation. Chris? So thank you, Sally. And first of all, I want to commend Gabor for um, a very thought-provoking presentation and extremely important research on a number of levels that everyone is struggling at the moment to get a better handle on what the underlying factors driving um, what some call illiberalism, uh, other forms of um, less accountable governance uh, that's emerged in any number of settings. And you focused on Central Europe, which has its own importance. Uh, you mentioned the fact that the countries of Central Europe in particular were seen as the most promising success stories of uh, young democracies, and now they're facing some special challenges. But at the same time, if we look as far afield as uh, the Philippines or Turkey, South Africa, these are countries in their own way that are evincing um, at least dimensions of some of these problems. And to the extent you can 
identify some of these underlying drivers, there may be something to learn in other contexts too, and I might ask you about that towards the end of my comments. Uh, but one thing that comes to mind just listening to your um, presentation, and I think this, this also makes it particularly important, is that to the extent social solidarity is being challenged because the times we live in are so uncertain and so unpredictable and in their own ways volatile, uh, we have, by all accounts, um, uh, you know, an unending wave of uh, automation coming online, artificial intelligence. And I think uh, some of the politics we're seeing today, even if they express themselves in um, different ways, sometimes not entirely articulate or uh, thorough ways, it's a reflection of this feeling of discomfort and unease and um, unpredictability. Part of it comes from employment status, part of it comes from identity, which you didn't mention during your presentation, but this might be something you could share at least some of your thoughts on. It may have been implicit in some of your remarks. But here, too, there are cases uh, both within the region and outside the region where economic factors and um, social instability are not at the top of the list of the problems. I put the Czech Republic in that category where they perform extremely well both on economic inequality factors, economic growth in the European Union context, and yet their politics are changing in a fairly dramatic way, uh, and they may only be partially on the track of the sort of changes they're undergoing. And so I wonder if you might, um, in a way, uh, reflect on your own arguments to see how you would apply the kind of working class social dislocation unease plus the national business class uh, equation to places where that doesn't seem like a, such a good fit. On the, on the business uh, side of things, I'd also like you to at least touch on whether you think um, Viktor Orban and Fidesz in the Hungarian case was uh, meeting a political market in Hungary, because you mentioned that uh, leading up to 2009, there was no general demand for a liberalism based on the surveys there. But in a way, if we, if we look back on what's happened over the last six or seven years, one could say that um, Viktor Orban's ideas were meeting a need in a way, even if you know, the, the data or the, the public opinion research doesn't suggest that. So that's one interpretation. But the other is whether um, his idea of the illiberal state, which he um, really crystallized in July 2014 in the speech he gave at the time, was creating a market, or whether these were mutually reinforcing features. So that's one part of the, the question. And the other is, um, you called the, the phenomenon with the business class the revolt of the national business class, and that they had become disenchanted, essentially, with uh, liberal capitalism by 2009-2010. Perhaps you could reflect just a little bit on what it was that caused the disenchantment is one thing that comes to mind is that when we look at other environments where the political, the paramount political leadership um, is looking to um, reduce uh, challenges to their authority, they have a lot of um, tools in the toolbox to create essentially uh, inducements and incentives as well as um, punitive measures for the business community um, this is especially visible in, in consolidated authoritarian environments. But is it not possible that in the Hungarian case, uh, there simply were benefits to aligning with the, what was emerging as a dominant political power in the absence of political opposition and with the dominant political power that was taking uh, fairly swift steps to marshal its um, institutional control in the judiciary, uh, which has significant role in uh, how business can operate and dispute uh, and settle claims, um, in the media sector, um, and elsewhere. 
and whether this was simply a practical decision that was made um, after the uh, Orban movement came and, and consolidated power, or whether this was something that uh, had taken hold in advance and therefore was also fertile terrain to be uh, nationalized in a sense, as you've described it. Because here too, I think for policy purposes and, and responding to these challenges, whether there, there are ways to preempt or in, in essence uh, ameliorate the more uh, unfavorable outcomes in some of these settings is uh, terribly important. And you've suggested a host of ways we might uh, respond to these challenges. And then I think in, the, in terms of terminology, um, you've referred to um, um, Mr. Babish in the Czech Republic as a, as a liberal populist. And I just wonder at which point um, on the continuum of populism does liberalism become less possible to retain? Because I think one of the, the things we see is that as populism takes wing and really gains traction, part of what comes with that is a diminishment of pluralism. And so I, it's just more of a theoretical question, but because you think about these things so deeply, I'd be curious for your, uh, your reaction to this. I probably have some other thoughts, but maybe I'll, I'll leave it there so we have time for questions. And I've given more than enough. You can choose to answer whatever part of it you'd like. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Gabor, would you like to take a stab at some of these sure. comments and questions? Thank you very much, uh, Chris, um, for, uh, for his uh, thorough uh, questions. Um, well, I, uh, where should I start? Um, well, let's, uh, I would like to address this question of, uh, you refer to this in, in multiple questions about identity and whether there was a, a, a need for for our band's ideas, so where they're meeting a, a, a certain certain need in in in, in Hungary, um, so this question of culture and, and identity is is, is essential, um, and uh, yeah, I I, I, am, I haven't uh, touched upon this, but I, I don't like monocausal uh, explanations, so I don't think that like economics explains away anything, just as I don't think that culture would explain anything. What I do believe is that uh, there's a need for a political economic approach because I looked at the literature on, on liberalism in Central and Eastern Europe and an overwhelming majority focuses on political supply of illiberal ideas and cultural demand. So I felt this need to, to contribute and, and emphasize a particular aspect. But I wouldn't say that like unemployment determines every, everything. So I think it's a, it's a very complex word, and politics is, of course, a, an even more complex issue here. And um, um, I, I'm not claiming to explain every political movement and political detail. What, I'm, I, I, what I think I, I, I might have an explanation for is longer-term institutional change. So whether political actors and economic actors will, on the long term, manage to restructure liberal capitalism and liberal democracy in Central Europe. So that's, that's what I'm trying to answer. From this perspective, I, I, don't, I, I don't really reflect on, on political details, just as, as for example, in, 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 in the Czech Republic. Uh, but there's definitely a general rise in, uh, in, in nationalist identities and different rooted uh, ethnic uh, identities <coughs> with the rise of global uncertainties. This is not just driven by economics, but this is just generally driven by, by dislocation of, of traditional identities. But I also believe it's also driven by the, the, by the lack of um, social protection and, and new insecurities. So you have to look at economic insecurities to be able to experience the rise of neo-nationalist identities. So I, I think these are, none of them determines the other. I think these are mutually the, uh, reinforcing uh, processes. Uh, and in th that respect, of course, Orban was meeting uh, a demand for, for li liberalism in Hungary, but I don't think that people were demanding authoritarianism, we want repression. No, 
I don't think. By the way, I think that there's no democracy anymore in Hungary. I haven't said this. I think it's a competitive authoritarian regime that has emerged in Hungary. But I don't think that people were demanding for this. What I think people were demanding is, is, a, is, is social protection and, and certain security, also cultural security, security of identities. And this is what Viktor Orban is, 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 is supplying. But you also have to take into consideration that uh, that the issue of migration was not really uh, a salient issue in 2009, 2010 in Hungary. So it was mostly driven by economics and discourses around um, global insecurities, the global crisis, austerity, unemployment, low employment, low wages, so these sort of things that have driven uh, the, the frustration of, of many people in Hungary and resulted in the two-thirds majority of, of, uh, of, of, of Viktor Orban. Um, about the business class, um, well, that's why I, uh, I, I, I mentioned that there are different segments of the business class. And uh, there are definitely people uh, the, uh, w whom I would call these passive, uh, sort of passive winners or uh, uh, beneficiaries of the new regime who, who haven't really lobbied for anything, uh, but they just sort of post hoc. After it happened, they realized that, well, it makes more sense to to behave uh, in a certain way. But there is a, a large chunk of investors in Hungary who have actively lobbied for institutional engineering. I haven't talked about the financial sector. And this has happened, uh, in, uh, this has started earlier, and there was a push for, from uh, a few major Hungarian investors in the financial sector to restructure finances, again, a sector that is overwhelmingly dominated by domestic investors, and they saw that there is a need for more national or domestic uh, ownership, and they couldn't just do it on their own, so they needed the help of the state. Uh, same story uh, in, the labor, uh, in, in the sector of labor regulation. And I mentioned that it's a labor-intensive production that most of the domestic companies are doing, like agriculture production, construction industry, tourism, so these sort of things. So there's no iPhone and such uh, manufactured by Hungarian uh, domestic capitalists. Although there's Prezi that I would like to mention, which is a very cool thing. That's, uh, that's one of the few uh, 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 exemptions. So there was a need to restructure the labor code, and they have started doing this already before 2010. And they almost achieved it under the previous socialist government. Uh, it was uh, like a reduction in uh, labor rights, uh, reduction in trade union rights, etc. Uh, but at the end, the socialist government backed away. And then they again lobbied, uh, uh, and they could achieve this under the new Fidesz regime. And if, of course, this has created a lot of victims, a lot of losers, this disillusionment among people who voted for Orban, and he knew it. And that's one of the reasons why he needed to preempt uh, uh, responses and, and reduce the sphere of pluralism. And, and I think uh, the new political economic model and, and, uh, and the reduction of pluralism, is, is uh, they go hand in hand in, in Hungary. We could go into other examples, but I think that's just a illustration. And finally, about uh, Babish, uh, liberal populism. <clears throat> yeah, uh, I, I don't know what's going to hap happen in the Czech Republic, but until now we haven't seen such a clear uh, coalition merging in the Czech Republic as in Hungary, where, uh, where there are national, like, businessmen supporting particular kind of politics and disillusioned uh, rural working class supporting more or less the same economic nationalism and deep restructuring of, uh, of liberal institutions. So it's multiple parties representing uh, these interests in the Czech Republic. That's why I think there was no major breakthrough <coughs> of illiberalism in that country. The question is, I think, whether Zeman, with his ability to mobilize disillusioned rural working class people, and Babish representing a certain group of, of uh, a certain type of uh, politically motivated entrepreneurs, whether they will agree on a set of policies, and whether they are sufficient enough to restructure, and whether there's even a need to restructure the institutions. So far, it looked to me that. But Bobbish is more interested in, like, I don't know, perfecting 
liberal institutions, so to say, uh, using heavy populism. And it's something to tell, uh, I mean, in the future to, uh, to see whether this populism will in fact result in, in a significant reduction of, of, of pluralism or not. But so far it hasn't happened in the traffic Republic. Well answered. And uh, we can now take some time for questions and comments. Uh, this gentleman here has raised his hand, and then Rudy will take yeah. several at a time, and then this, this lady here. Okay, Hello. two things. Uh, could um, you introduce yourself, please? Okay, uh, Richard Lahan, I was AIFLD, country director, regional director. Hello. Member of CWA. Um, on what happened in Hungary, I think we're missing something. <clears throat> Did a lot of people just sit on their hands and let events flow? <clears throat> and as they flowed, the people who were active were imposing whatever they were trying to impose. And to a certain extent, we had that in 2016 here in the States. Everybody reacted in 2017. Thank you. That <coughs> That's the first part of the question. Second part of the question is this. Um, why can't countries like the United States do something? We have influence in economic forums, investment, trade. You have to go through our banks. Why does some of the things that Poland and, um, <coughs> and Hungary doing, why do we have to put it up with them? Thank you you want to do much. it? Fine. Thank you. And now we had a gentleman. Yes, Rudy. Hi, uh, Rudy Porter from the Solidarity Center. I want to <clears throat> commend your analysis, especially uh, your identification of inequality before two 2010 as a uh, main motivating factor for the success. I, I know you just said that uh, migration was not an issue before 2010, and, and I would agree with you. But it, it clearly is now a main component of what Orban is trying to use to, to promote fear among the working class and, and support for his policies, including the bill we saw today of punishing uh, organizations that assist migrant workers. Can you say a little bit more about the use of anti-migrant policies, anti-migrant uh, propaganda in, the, in this uh, administration? Thank you, and one more, this lady here just in front. Thank you. Um, I'm Mindy Reiser. I'm vice president of an NGO called Global Peace Services. I've also worked in your part of the world and other contexts. Okay, two uh, quick questions. In terms of the downward spiral of unemployment, what was going on in terms of job retraining, searching out new promising sectors, looking at ways to take people into a productive mode rather than giving them the option of early retirement? I realize there are limits to that, but I want to hear about that. And the second part is the implications of these policies to the health and well-being of the EU. There are mechanisms that are supposed to go into force to counter some of these uh, approaches that are counter to EU norms. What about the ILO? We talk a lot about Brexit, but it seems to me what's going on here is very damaging to what the EU is supposed to be all about. Thank you very much. Gabor, three, three overarching questions. Maybe more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm going to be quick and uh, I'll start with the last question, uh, the role of the EU. Well, um, I think we shouldn't wait for the EU to do something. <laughs> and the main reason is called the European People's Party. And the particularity with Orban is that he, does, he didn't start out at the fringes. He was uh, a conservative liberal and he's very well embedded in the European People's Party. And they need Orban. He delivers a lot of votes for the European People's Party. And they just won't do anything that would m damage Orban in a significant way. Uh, and another reason I haven't touched upon this 
So Orban is giving new opportunities to friends and domestic enterprises, but he knows that the Hung Hungary is dependent on foreign investment. And the major foreign actor in Hungary is German business. And Orban is trying to do everything to keep German businesses satisfied. And they are very happy. There was just a recent article in the Handelsblatt, which is this leading German uh, weekly, and it featured interviews with businessmen operating in Poland and Hungary, and they are extremely happy. So this kind of authoritarian capitalism seems to f f satisfy uh, German businessmen operating uh, in, in, in Hungary, at least uh, uh, some of them in, in the productive uh, sector in, 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 in industries. So they wouldn't really uh, attack uh, Orban significantly. So I think uh, other actors, other international actors can, uh, can, do, can do more. Of course, there have been responses from, from the EU, so I don't want to uh, <coughs> neglect these, especially uh, regarding corruption. There's an ongoing uh, investigation about uh, Viktor Orban's family, uh, but that's, this is, again, very slow, and we will know what, what, what's, going to, what's going to happen. Mm. Why can the U.S. do something? I, uh, well, that's a very good question. I think uh, it's a very difficult situation to intervene in domestic affairs of a NATO ally who was seen as a major reform country. Um, and so what, what, what would you do like, you know, like that is diplomatically sustainable? This is, I think, a completely, these are completely uncharted waters, so to say. And I see why there was a reluctance to intervene uh, more uh, directly. Uh, but I can see the signs that this is changing with, for example, the support for independent, independent media. That's, uh, that's, that's a good sign. I just read today a piece of news. Uh, there is a, there's an ongoing trial uh, by, in, in Hungary against two people who were charged by the Hungarian government uh, with, uh, of espionage, handing over defense, like, like secrets, to the IMF and the US government. And now this is related to, uh, to a particular case when the US government banned six leading Hungarian officials from entering uh, the US. No one really knows the details, but this is going on, and I can see the political difficulties with that, but I, I'm just referring to this case that I read today that this is actually, um, this, is, this, is, this is going on. Um, was there an opportunity to increase employment in Hungary, and, and that, thus preempting uh, neo-nationalism? Of course, everyone tried to do that, but it didn't work out. One reason was that uh, everyone was focusing on capital-intensive production by foreign investors, which helped a lot to modernize Hungarian economy. So these are technologically highly complex export-oriented companies that came to Hungary, contribute to the GDP a lot. But what they do is they produce a lot, but, um, but don't really employ that many people. So by focusing on them, you contribute to GDP, but don't contribute to employment. And that's one of the reasons of severe economic dualism. So that's why I think we need to refocus uh, uh, industrial policies. And finally, migration. Yes, it's a, it's a, new, it's a new issue. Um, and the, it cannot be explained completely by economic insecurities, though I think when you talk to people, many of them would say, well, I don't want migrants to take away my benefits. And they even say this about Hungarians. You know, there is a large Hungarian minority living around the borders of Hungary. And when they enter the country, they have Hungarian citizenship now. Many Hungarians fear that they would claim benefits. And they have this same sort of welfare chauvinism against them. So I would argue that more sort of solidarity and security would decrease the level of fear. Politicians could play the politics of fear still, and I don't have a clear answer to that, but I think that more security would definitely uh, lower the chances of, of, uh, of nationalist uh, mobilization using migration and, and migrants as, as scapegoats. And just one, one additional observation uh, relating to Rudy's question. The, the fact of the matter is uh, none of the Visegrad countries, as far as I'm aware, have taken any meaningful number of migrants. It's a very small number, and it's mostly been instrumentalized um, in these settings. Often, in some of the cases, I think it's true in Hungary too, it's a relevant issue that as media can't um, 
in an unfettered way and explain these issues with competing points of view, it becomes a lot trickier within these countries' borders to situate these things. Most of these uh, migrants are making their way up to Scandinavia and Germany, and that's where they want to go, and that's where they're ending up. And so Central Europe, Southeastern Europe, uh, the Baltic states, that's not where they're going. They're going to Scandinavia and Germany. Yeah. So we are talking about 1,000 to 2,000 migrants that have been sort of uh, relocated to Hungary. So that's, that's not a number, but I mean, people really have been induced this, this fear, and they clearly fear. And there are these reports. You go to a, just a regular rural town in, in, in Hungary, and they see uh, strangers. Very often, these are Hungarians. For example, relatives who visit their relative, the graves of their relatives, go to these towns in Hungary, and then people are calling the police that there are these migrants lurking around the town. You should do something. So there is really this crazy fear. But you have to understand that last year, in 2017, the Orban government has spent 80 billion forints on government propaganda which equals almost like it's three quarters of the amount that the socialist government has spent on government propaganda between 2006 and 2010. And there's other ways to, 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 to fuel this, this hate campaign. This is just one, one particular uh, way of doing that. And if you go to Hungary, you can see these crazy billboards and, and whatever. So it's a... Uh, it's a very nasty political engineering of fear. There have been three hands raised, Mark Platner, and then two just behind. So starting with Mark. Thank you. Uh, it was a very interesting presentation, Gabor. You began with a puzzle of why these champions of democratic transition like Hungary and Poland have now uh, de-democratized and so on. And I agree that's a, a very great puzzle, but it, what puzzles me even more about these cases and similar cases elsewhere, I think of the Philippines, for example, is these kind of liberal leaders when they come to power is they continue to have popular support. I don't know what the, the latest statistics on Orban's uh, public approval ratings are, but I know for quite a while they were high. I think that's true of Kaczynski in Poland. Um, and in terms of a political economy analysis of the kind you did, is, is, are there economic policies? Also, it seems the economies have not gone the way of Venezuela or anything like that. I mean, are they being successful? How? Uh, how do you account for the akin continuing support that these kinds of regimes have been getting? Thank you. Robert Benjamin with uh, the National Democratic Institute. Gabor, thanks very much. I like your presentation for two reasons. One is we're focusing on indigenous uh, conditions in Hungary and the Visegrad. A lot of attention is rightly placed on external influences coming from the European Union, coming from the United States, coming from Russia. We have to understand these countries, these societies, uh, from where they're coming from as well. And that's probably more important. The second reason is because, as someone who focuses on the political side of things, I really appreciate the opportunity to look at the economics. My question is actually in line with Marx, and that is, I was, the data you were showing suggests this economic insecurity that, that uh, the current government has been able to pair with identity, national uh, uh, insecurity, and then rev it up through all sorts of uh, instrumentalizing uh, uh, policies and whatnot. And then importantly, uh, uh, seek, it seems, to dismantle the de democratic checks and balances that would allow for pluralism, would allow for fair political competition. And I think that always has to be remembered as being the central democracy agenda that we should be focusing on and not get too distracted by what is offered as left versus right and uh, uh, sovereign versus federal and what have you. But to Mark's point, I mean, your formula would lead us down a road suggesting that a lot of the national economic basis now is somewhat captured space. 
how are workers faring uh, precisely um, ten, now eight years on from when Orban, uh, it's, it's, it's his economy. And so where there may not be a political opportunity to discuss that, nevertheless, if you look at empirical data, if you look at some of the vulnerability statistics you offered now, how are people doing? And do they not only feel, do they feel more secure economically in this illiberal, whatever you want to call it, version of capitalism? And this lady here just down the way. Thank you. I'm Viola Ginger. I'm a writer and editor and um, supported independent media in the region for, uh, for some years. Um, you started uh, with, on the premise that Hungary's institutions were quite strong before all this happened, but were they really if they were if they collapsed or were dismantled relatively quickly and simply and when I talk about institutions, I mean in, including civil society and civic engagement um, uh, uh, at a at a really deep level w were those really was that really strong and what about some of the other institutions, the checks and balances? Um, and, and my other question was, was along the, the same lines of what has happened economically since Orban has come into office and has, have things become significantly better, but now he's captured um, the political and social um, environment or, or it, um, are, are things still still bad? Thank you. Very, very good questions. Thank you so much for, for these great questions. Um, so yeah, let's start with, uh, with the second one in, about institutions and, and civil society and just very briefly. Well, I think that they were strong, measured by quality of institutions as they were measured by the EBRD or many other uh, institutions. And in fact, uh, like the Hungarian Constitutional Court has really had uh, strong uh, um, possibilities to intervene into politics, as did many other, I mean, I, like the guarantees of, of its independent uh, central bank and, and all these institutions were, were established. And until the, the second half of the 2000s, if you looked at uh, EBRD reform scores, Hungary was always ranked highest. And then there were these institutional reforms and democracy scores, and they were just these regression lines. And Hungary was always sort of at the top. Um, uh, and I think uh, from certain perspective, they were even, I would say, too strong. And many people argue that they were sort of elitist institutions without social foundation. And they contributed to building tension, well, you have a great constitutional court, but I'm indebted, and the banks are killing me, as people would say, so what can you do? And they couldn't do anything. So they were sort of not embedded into society, and political movements, social movements, didn't really have the opportunity to, to express their political concerns strongly. Now, this is something in line of the argument of, of right-wing intellectuals in Hungary, who would say that we had these liberal rights-based constitutions in Hungary and in many other countries, now we need sort of this political constitutionalism. And I think the, the, the element of truth there is that these were really established from the top and were seen by many people as, as floating above society and not really uh, contributing to, to, to what, what matters to people. Uh, but they were strong. And uh, I, I certainly do agree with those commentators who would say that strong institutions are, are not enough. I also think that, well, civil society participation wasn't that strong as, as compared to, as, as in Western Europe, but in post-socialist terms, it was relatively good. And I would even say that especially you had this very strong embeddedness of Fides in civil society. And there was this whole civic circle movement around Fides. Now that was civil society as well. A lot of them were not like, I don't know, nasty fascists or anything like that. It was a right-wing civic culture, so strong embeddedness, there you have it in civil society, didn't really help that much in stopping what Orban uh, was doing. Um, so I think it's, uh, 
It's a, it's a difficult question, but I would say that there were strong institutions, but there was something lacking, and they were not sort of socially embedded and socially sustainable institutions. That's why I said at the end of my presentations that liberal institutions need to be sustainable uh, socially, and how to achieve that, that's a, that's a very, very tough, tough question. And uh, about Orban's popular support, um, that's again a very complex issue. We don't know the result of the upcoming elections. There are elections upcoming in April, but we know the result of the of the previous one. And in 2014, so there was an election in 2010. That's when Orbán received the two-thirds majority. There was one in 2014, and there was, of, of course, another one in 2006 when Orbán lost and the socialists won. Now, if you compare the number of votes Fidesz received in 2006 and in 2014, when they again win one two-thirds majority, they actually received less votes in 2014 when they won a two-thirds majority than they received in 2006 when they lost. So that's the question, how they managed to achieve that. And here comes institutional engineering, gerrymandering, uh, uh, capturing the media, and the divided opposition and the new electoral law that we have in Hungary. That's again a very clever institutional maneuvering because there's a need for renewal. A lot of people mistrust previous elites, but there's also a need for unity among oppositional groups. And that's why there's really hard to come to a unified opposition in Hungary because some people would say we need to renew and we need to establish new parties, and there are these new parties emerging every year, like every year you have six new parties emerging in Hungary because everyone wants to renew politics, and there's a need to renew politics. But there's also a need to form a unified opposition, and, and achieving the two is just very, very difficult. And, and until the, there's no unified opposition, Fidesz can have, again, a two-thirds majority even without having less votes than they had in 2006. Having said that, there are clear successes as well uh, in terms of um, growing employment in Hungary, for example. That's, that's something that Orban managed to achieve. And I think what we also have to see is that he's using this, uh, so as liberalism as an institutional solution is withdrawing s from different social spheres, you have this, this kind of neo-feudalism emerging in social fields both at the top, at the, at the nation state, you have these new feudal patron-client relationships emerging, but also locally, in local governments, you have these, where you have strong men who are protecting the poor. So if you are poor, you have to be a friend with the mayor because he's the one who is, he is, who is giving out uh, you the opportunity to engage in public works. And there are 200 people, 200,000 people in Hungary engaged in public works schemes. So you also have these new feudal dependency relationships that are used for political purposes as well. But there are clear improvements as well in, in, in Hungary. So it's a, it's a difficult task. But I would say that the improvement in itself would not be enough uh, to secure, again, a two-thirds majority for Orban. It has mainly to do with the delegitimization and the dividedness of the opposition and, and the very uneven playing, play, political playing field. We have time for just another couple of questions. This gentleman here has raised his hand. Yes. Are there any other questions? Okay. Yes, sir. Yes. I'm an editor in Copenhagen. When I'm coming to this concert, which I do quite often, you all, I always listen to people here making the EU a laughing stock. When I look at the Congress and this country, I'm not sure who is laughing. And when it comes to democracy, do, can EU learn anything from your Congress, from your president? Can I ask you, you know, the uh, Hungary, Poland, is being supported by Mr. Trump. Another thing, just, uh, just to clarify the issue is that the EU is a democracy. That means that all decisions are being taken in unity. Now that means when it comes to, to uh, Hungary, that Poland and Hungary, of course, and Czech Republic is going to veto if the EU touches Hungary. There is a, this is a very difficult legal matter, how, how this is being done 
if you have to exclude a country, uh, that is, this is not very easy, but they are trying to figure out in the near future how you can change the whole, you might say, the whole system and idea of EU. Could you this ask your question, sir, because we I'm are a, coming to closure. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm just coming with a, a couple of remarks here. So the, I have no question here, okay, just, just to be you. sure. <laughs> thank you. Just to be sure you know that. I'd like thank yes. you from the EU. Um, I, I totally agree with you, sir. I was just uh, emphasizing the difficulties that the EU has in intervening. So. Okay. Well, I think if there are no further questions, I want to uh, thank Christopher Walker for his comments. I want to thank you all for your participation, and I want to congratulate Gabor on his presentation and wish him and his wife, Noemi, who is here with us today, a very happy Valentine's Day. Please join me in congratulating.